just about remembered. Okay, so thank you once again for, for the invitation uh, to speak at um, this uh, webinar series. And as you've already mentioned, I will be talking about um, biosphere atmosphere interactions, um, looking at it within the perspective of um, a changing global climate. Um, I want to say thank you to two people who um, have been very, very um, supportive of my work um, as a PhD student and my transitioning into um, becoming a postdoc, um, Kirsty Ashworth and Oliver Wild, both uh, at the Lancaster Environment Center um, here at Lancaster University. So um, my talk basically looks at two um, parts of the global um, uh, climate system. So um, the atmosphere, which is the um, part of the um, climate just above, above our heads, and the biosphere, which is the part that houses uh, living things. So, but um, for purposes of, of this talk, I will be limiting myself to forests and forest environments. Uh, and why, why is, is this um, important to, to talk about? Well, the interactions between um, forest or the biosphere and the atmosphere um, drives uh, several processes in, in, in the global climate system. So um, as shown by this um, schematic on the right-hand side, um, we have solar radiation, um, carbon dioxide, um, and so on from the atmosphere coming into the forests and, and forests or plants use these uh, in photosynthesis, for example. But in, in return, um, the forest also uh, release a lot of water vapor, which helps in cloud formation. Um, they also release uh, large volumes of oxygen, um, which is, is needed by uh, living things, for example, including us to survive. And they also release large amounts of um, volatile organic compounds. Um, they emit large VOC amounts into the atmosphere. And these are very important for reasons that um, we'll talk about um, shortly. And so um, atmospheric variables control um, plant growth and productivity. Um, things like soil nutrients, soil moisture um, could also be a limiting factor to plant growth. Um, and, and these processes, as, I, as I've said, um, they control atmospheric composition, air quality at um, local, regional, and global scale. And they also drive the, the, the carbon and hydrological cycles. And so it's important that uh, we understand the various processes and how climate change or changes in environmental conditions are likely to affect um, these processes going uh, forward. Um, and, and the focus on, on forests is because, um, again, they are a major component of the global climate change mitigation strategy. Um, in addition to cutting emissions, um, forests cover up to 32% of Earth's total land area, and they actually store more carbon than the atmosphere or the ocean. And so they are, they are a very, very important um, source of carbon storage. Um, but as we've heard, earlier this week about agriculture, land use and land use change. Um, these are very, very important parts of um, the strategy towards uh, mitigating against climate change now and also going uh, into the future. And particularly afforestation and reforestation programs have been announced at national and regional levels and also at, at uh, the recent um, COP26 uh, leaders from over 100 countries actually agreed to stop deforestation. And that's very important because if we look at the um, map on the left side, you can see two different color schemes, a very dark green showing forests that used to be, or the extent of forest co coverage um, originally um, about say 10,000 years ago. And the lighter green showing uh, the extent of forest coverage um, presently. And so we've lost 
quite a, a, a large proportion of forest to deforestation uh, over the last, um, say, 10,000 years. And, and, and therefore, stopping deforestation is an important um, activity, which is why world leaders have pledged to, to do that at COP26. Um, obviously, there are, there are issues um, with agricultural output and food availability and so on when um, you roll out afforestation um, programs. So just to put that in, in context of um, UK, since um, uh, most of the talks have actually centered on, on, on the United Kingdom, um, currently about 12% or 13% of, of UK um, land is, is uh, forested. And that's risen from about 12% in the 19, um, uh, 90s, 98, there about. Um, but the forest cover is not enough um, for um, what the UK needs to do to uh, reach net zero, for example. Um, the Committee for Climate Change, CCC, recommends that um, up to 30,000 hectares of new forest will be needed every year um, going forward up to 2050 if the UK is to meet its net zero targets. Um, that will increase forest cover from um, the current 13% to about um, 17% and will require about 20% of agricultural land uh, to be converted to forest in the process. Obviously, uh, as I said previously, it raises issues about food, food availability and cost and so on. But perhaps the, 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 the bigger worry as uh, shown by the, the, this um, map on the right-hand side, which is taken from the Woodland Trust, is that the UK is actually doing very woefully um, in its um, afforestation program. So um, Scotland, which is even doing um, well, is only doing about 43% of what it needs to be doing um, at the moment. And, and other places, um, Northern Ireland, Wales, and England are far, far behind. Uh, in fact, the UK is currently doing just about um, 10,000 hectares um, per year when, when the CCC recommends more than 20,000 hectares per year. So there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And in addition to the fact that um, the world is not meeting its um, its targets on afforestation and deforestation and so on, forests are increasingly being subjected to um, stresses, um, abiotic stresses. And that is where my research uh, comes in. And, and that will be the focus of um, the presentation from now on. So my, my work usually focuses on using observations uh, indicated on the left-hand side um, and then combining that with models, so um, land surface models, that uh, could be one, one dimensional model looking at um, atmospheric chemistry within the forest environment, but also looking generally at um, processes such as photosynthesis and so on um, in the model, and then combining it with observations and looking at um, how the models are performing, um, what we can understand about the role of these abiotic stresses in the forest environment, and also how we can uh, then improve um, on, on the modeling of these processes. So I focus mostly on forest productivity, BVOC emissions, and abiotic stresses, and how these are interacting, and how they are likely to change going forward um, in, 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 in the future. So the rest of this talk will, will um, focus on how drought stress and um, air pollution um, affect plant growth and productivity, uh, and particularly looking at isoprene emission rates. And uh, again, I'll explain why uh, isoprene is a focus, and also how soil moisture stress affects plant growth and productivity, and so um, carbon sequestration capacity, and also looking at ozone damage and ozone uptake and how that affects plants. So to start with isoprene, um, plants emit um, various 
BVOCs, and one of them is isoprene. And it is emitted as a way to deal with um, heat stress and oxidative stress. Um, emission rates depend on several factors, including um, solar radiation, temperature, the age of leaves, um, atmospheric um, carbon dioxide concentrations, pollution, and so on. But um, soil moisture is emerging as uh, a very important factor in isoprene emissions. Um, and isoprene is the focus primarily because it is the most abundant um, BVOC emitted by plants. It makes up about 50% of all BVOCs emitted by plants, and it controls the atmospheric oxidation capacity and methane concentrations. It is also very important in the um, chemical production and loss of ozone, which is a greenhouse gas, but it also has an indirect impact on, um, on global climate through the formation of secondary organic aerosols. These secondary organic aerosols are very important in cloud formation. And since clouds can either absorb or um, reflect solar radiation, um, it is uh, an important factor in global climate. So uh, in 2018, the United Kingdom uh, experienced uh, prolonged heat wave and drought. And as shown by the, the, the plots from the Met Office um, for rainfall on the left and temperatures on the right, most places in the UK actually had um, a reduction in um, in rainfall. So as much as 70% decline in rainfall for parts of Southern England, at the same time, temperatures rose significantly, um, more than two degrees Celsius above um, average for that time of year. Um, and, and this was also experienced across Europe. Uh, uh, most places in Europe experienced this um, heat wave and drought. Uh, but it, it provided a good opportunity to study the impact of such an event on forest emission rates and, and uh, in, 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 a, in a natural environment. And so um, we made some measurements in, in a, a woodland near Oxford um, called Whiteham Woods. And uh, we measured isoprene emission rates at four levels within the forest. So just above the canopy, within the canopy space, at um, trunk level and near the surface. And these measurements covered a period of about five months from um, May through to October. Um, oak it being the dominant emitter of isoprene in this forest. Um, and, and there are several other uh, species in this, in this forest. So it's a very, very important forest uh, in terms of, to study in terms of uh, BVOC emissions. So, we, we get a long um, term data sets on isoprene emissions, and we've combined that with um, a model to try and understand what's happening in terms of emissions, in terms of um, mixing ratio, in terms of the chemistry going on within um, the, the forest environment and how that might change um, going forward. And, and the initial uh, model simulations um, show that um, the model is underestimating isoprene emission rates. So on the left-hand side are plots showing um, observations in black and the model estimates in orange. Um, and basically what it's showing is that outside the heat wave period, which is shown in gray, so the heat wave and drought period is shown in gray and outside that period, the model was reproducing um, the observations. But during the drought and heat wave period, the model underestimated observations by as much as 40%. Um, and that's because the model is not able to account for some of the processes that's going on um, within the forest environment. And it's important to get this right because models actually are central to all the climate change mitigation uh, efforts uh, or the climate change talks that go on are uh, centered on model estimates or um, projections. And so it's important that we get all the various processes right in these um, models. 
So, and, and one of the, or the main reason this is happening is that currently, sorry, my, I, I'm just going to turn on the light. Um, it just went off, I'll, I'll, one, one second. Sorry about that. Um, isoprene emissions are actually uh, coupled to photosynthesis. So plants take up carbon dioxide during photosynthesis and use a portion of that um, carbon dioxide to synthesize and emit isoprene. And um, when doing drought or mild or moderate drought stress, that process is decoupled. So the rate of isoprene emission is no longer uh, linked entirely to photosynthesis. And isoprene emissions increase initially before dropping to in line with photosynthesis, but the models fail to capture that. And so by doing a series of experiments using leaf temperature, um, soil moisture, and so on, we are able to improve that model um, uh, estimate. And so you can see that um, experiments including leaf temperature, soil moisture, and so much of us, um, uh, soil moisture plus soil and actually lead to improving the model estimates, which is shown in the different colors, so red, green, and blue. And, and the observations are still shown in black. And you can see that we've gone from overestimating, underestimating by about 40% to matching the observations. Um, and again, this is important within in the context of changing climate because um, anomalous drought events, so this events such as what happened in 2018 or the 2003 uh, heat wave across Europe, are expected to increase um, with, with global climate change. That would uh, have uh, impact on isoprene emissions and could lead to a substantial increase um, as droughts become more frequent and severe. And that, again, could lead to up to 10% of the carbon that is uptake during photosynthesis being re-emitted back into the atmosphere as um, BVOCs. And so if you think about um, all the efforts being put into um, planting trees so that they can photosynthesize and take out carbon dioxide, then there's a possibility that um, in the event of um, droughts and heat waves becoming more and more frequent, a sizable proportion of that um, photosynthesis or that carbon that's taken up during photosynthesis could be re-emitted back into the atmosphere as BVOCs. And so it's important to, to look at it. Um, the next leg of, of the presentation looks at uh, drought stress and ozone damage on, on plant um, productivity uh, in the context of climate change. So usually when we mention ozone, or uh, the, the first thing that comes to mind is the ozone, uh, ozone hole, or, or uh, in, and as shown by uh, the image on the right-hand side. And, and that's important because the um, ozone layer actually protects us from harmful solar radiation and, and helps us to stay um, healthy. Um, but then that's ozone, in the stratosphere. Um, ozone, when it is in the troposphere or near the surface, is actually bad for our health. It, it, it affects human um, health and leads to loss of lives. Um, thousands of people die every year uh, as a result of poor air pollution. Um, but it also affects plant growth and productivity. Um, each year, billions and billions of dollars worth of crops um, wheat, maize, and so on, is lost as a result of um, ozone damage. And as um, ozone is taken up into the stomata of plants, so the stomata is those um, very, very tiny, tiny um, holes in the leaves that opens up to allow um, carbon dioxide into the leaf for photosynthesis. But as the plants open, they also take in pollutants such as um, ozone. And ozone, once it gets into the stomata, um, causes damage to the stomata aperture and reduces photosynthetic capacity. It has, this has impact on um, the ability of, of the plants to photosynthesize and therefore take out carbon from the atmosphere, um, which has impacts on carbon sequestration capacity 
and therefore negatively affects climate um, change mitigation efforts. Um, and so again, one, one, one of the um, studies that we've done looks at um, running a model um, over several sites and looking at um, the impact of drought stress, ozone damage, and their combination on forests. So on the right-hand side, um, this plot is showing um, observations of gross primary productivity, which is basically photosynthesis um, and latent heat process. So the observations are shown in black. And then an initial model simulation that looks like um, that ignores the effect of drought stress and ozone damage is shown in the orange bar, that is um, control simulation. And in that simulation, we see that um, the model overestimates um, gross primary productivity and latent heat fluxes by about 30%. But then once we begin to add in the impact of drought stress, that overestimation drops to just about eight or 6%. Um, so that's an improvement of, of more than 20%. Uh, and if we add just the impact of um, ozone, that is about 11 or 10 percent improvement in model estimation. But then when the two um, factors are combined, as in drought stress and ozone damage, in the last columns, which is the gray um, bars with the stripes, then the overestimation drops to just about 2 percent or 1 percent. Uh, and this, as I said, was done for different ecosystems um, with varying numbers for them. But basically the story from all of these um, studies is that um, latent heat fluxes and GPP is overestimated when you ignore the effect of drought stress and ozone damage. Um, but then drought stress has a bigger uh, impact on, on forest than ozone across different ecosystems, um, Mediterranean or boreal ecosystems. Um, and, but then the combined impact of these two drought, uh, these two stress factors actually produces a better match between observations and the models. And we see a similar result in future climates. Again, going back to why models are important, the models are the main tool used to estimate what would happen in future climates um, when we if we if we plant so much forest what would happen how much carbon is it going to take and so all that is done with the models and so it's important that these processes are factored into it and um, again the the impact of ozone is 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 likely from that the, the indirect impact of ozone is estimated to outweigh the direct radiative force. And as, as I have already indicated, ozone is a greenhouse gas. And so it directly affects climate change uh, or, or global climate. But then it's the indirect impact um, as indicated by this uh, plot taken from Sitch et al. 2007, shows that um, by the end of this century, ozone concentrations um, could increase um, rapidly, especially in the tropical regions. Um, and that will have uh, a huge impact. It could reduce um, GPP by as much as 30% in the tropical regions. Now you need to, uh, I need to say that the tropical regions are responsible for the bulk of um, global photosynthesis and carbon capture. And so if you're reducing that carbon capture in the tropics by as much as 30% due to ozone, that is a huge, huge loss, um, a huge, huge uh, problem for the ability to meet um, global climate um, targets to reach net zero and therefore reduce, uh, limit uh, global warming to less than 1.5 as envisaged by the Paris uh, Climate Accord. And tropical uh, Mediterranean forests are particularly vulnerable because of the high temperatures in these regions coupled with the solar uh, radiation, which is crucial for ozone formation uh, in these uh, regions. And, and droughts, as I've already indicated, will become more prevalent going forward and will further compound um, this problem. So um, I guess what I have 
said up to this point is that um, forests are important in, in global climate mitigation efforts and, and we definitely need more forests, more tree plantations and so on. But it, it, they are not um, to be considered as the silver bullet um, in climate change mitigation efforts. Um, partly because as, as this um, plot on the right hand side shows, and this is taken from um, a report by uh, Coombs et al. Uh, and basically showing that even uh, when, if, even if, if we take um, enhanced afforestation into consideration, um, the initial carbon uptake would reduce in the long run. Um, by by the 2070s or 2060s onwards, and that is because as forests become mature, they cease to be net sinks of carbon dioxide. So they they no longer they 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 just taking in enough carbon dioxide to um, basically exist, um, and they could actually become net sources of of carbon dioxide. We had last Friday um, about how plants. Uh, as part of this webinar series we had last Friday about how plants can actually put carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And so mature forests um, have been found to uh, cease to be net sinks of carbon dioxide. So eventually, even if we plant all the forests and except where we manage these forests um, over time, they could actually um, stop being net sinks of, of carbon dioxide. And therefore, as I have said, um, there's the need for other, other measures beyond just afforestation or, or planting more forest. And as I've indicated um, and shown uh, to you, um, effects of drought stress, ozone damage, and other um, such processes are also going to affect forest productivity and growth going into the future and, and all that needs to be accounted for um, as, as global climate continues to um, change. So um, just to sum up uh, or to, to conclude, um, forests are playing uh, an important role, but um, their role going into the future or in a changing climate um, remains uh, somewhat uh, uncertain, or there are some uncertainties, especially about um, the effect of drought stress on emission rates, the effect of ozone damage, and, and, and other such pollutants on forest productivity and its ability to um, uptake carbon, and therefore uh, how much forest will be able to contribute to the global climate uh, mitigation efforts. Thanks for your attention and um, ready to take your questions. Thanks very much, Fred, for a, a little bit of a depressing talk, if I'm honest. So, uh, but yeah, no, very interesting stuff and, and certainly stuff that I had not considered myself. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in. So let me encourage people to, to put questions in the, in the Q&A, but let me kick off. So, so I hadn't really considered isoprene and, and the fact that um, some of this, you know, some of the carbon, carbon dioxide taken in through photosynthesis won't all go into sugars and won't be helped there, but it will be lost into the environment. So, so you said this isn't really considered in the modeling. How is there any move to move this into more mainstream models or, you know, what's your knowledge of that? Yes. Um, so uh, I think one of the reasons that not, that had not been done previously was because we, we, we didn't have the sort of long-term records um, that would allow um, this sort of um, understanding to, to, to come up. Um, it's only recently, I mean, the, the data I showed from White and Woods is one of the, it's, it's one of just two such long-term measurements. Um, the other was, was conducted in the US in, in 2011, 2012, and also shows similar, similar results. And so, uh, now, now the data is available. Studies are being conducted, and therefore, it's it's becoming it's coming into um, the the scientific community is beginning to um, um, get these ideas out uh, into 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 the modeling and and policy policy 
um, realm. Um, because previously, it, as I said, it had generally been assumed that um, isoprene emission is, is linked to photosynthesis. So if photosynthesis increases, isoprene emission increases. And if drought occurs and photosynthesis declines, then isoprene emission will decline. But that's not um, what actually happens in, in the case of all droughts. If the drought is severe, then yes, um, isoprene emissions will decline. But if the drought is moderate or mild, then there's a there's the likelihood that isoprene emission will actually increase with um, with the drought. So yes, mm. the, um, efforts are being made. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, thanks. That and that kind of answers a little bit of Alan's Alan Horgan's question. Who he said, you know, how's this message going to get out to from scientists into politicians? So so let me ask a question from uh, Vadim Vadim Volkov. So he uh, he says thanks for the interesting information about isoprene emissions. Um, uh, where's that going? So how, what are the main concentrations of isoprene in the atmosphere and what are the main sources of the emission? So the, the main sources um, of, of uh, isoprene are forests. Um, and, in, and in fact, if we look at VOCs in general, forests contribute about 90% um, of all the VOCs into the atmosphere and in particular tropical forests. So because of the type of species that are available there and also because of the climate. So isoprene emissions, as I, as I indicated, um, are, are linked to temperature, uh, solar radiation and so on. And, and because you have a lot of uh, radiation, high temperatures in the tropics, emission rates in the tropics are, are very, very high. Uh, in terms of the actual amount of um, isoprene or BVOCs in the atmosphere, um, it, 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 the estimates are about 500 um, teragrams of, of carbon uh, being emitted each year into the atmosphere as, as isoprene alone. Um, I, hope, I hope that answers um, the question. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, okay, so. Let me follow up a question um, from anonymous attendee. He asked, "What's this is a slightly slightly um, peripheral maybe to your your knowledge, but what role does the biota of the soils of mature forests play as a carbon sink as compared to plantations, new plantations?" Um, I, I again, it's this is this is uh, slightly out of my. Um, my but basically the, the one of the, the, the key reasons why um, mature forests cease to be um, a net carbon sinks is that is, is um, the lack of, of nutrients. So at some point these uh, mature forests um, use up most of the nutrients in the soil. so um, nitrogen, phosphorus and so on. And therefore, the, the, the lack of nutrients um, becomes a limiting factor to the ability to uptake carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, 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 uh, and sequester it. OK, so um, we have actually a hand up. So let's see. So um, Shazadi, if you would like to, I mean, I can. Oh, hang on. And mute you there. So, if you'd like to ask a question, is are you there? Um, should I stop sharing my screen? You can do. You can do. Yeah. Okay. All right. There we go. Maybe with that question's not coming through. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to another uh, question from the from the chat. Um, so from Rupert Knowles, here we go. I had not understood how isoprene and drought about isoprene and drought. However, it is obvious that all forests and grasslands will reach peak carbon when mature. It is land use change that is important, either destroying forests or planting new ones. Do you think that planting forests is just a short term answer to carbon sequestration until we can get BECCS going. I'm not sure what BECCS is. Maybe you know. Um, I think that's uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Okay. If, okay. If, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so 
to, to some extent, yes, it's a, it's a short-term solution. I, I, as I said, um, it depends on what we're using the forest for. If, if it's a managed forest, especially taking into account the fact that once they mature, they will cease to be um, net sink, then you could, you could manage that forest. And so you could have a plan in place where as the plants mature, you, you cut them, maybe use them in furniture, use them in buildings, um, which will then store that carbon. If you, if you use the wood in, in a building or in, in construction, you're storing that carbon in the wood for um, a couple of years and then replanting it. But it, that, would, that would require um, concerted effort, um, well thought out uh, plan of action to um, do that. But definitely it's, as I said, it's, it's not um, the silver bullet to um, climate change mitigation. Um, the main thing we need to do is to actually cut emissions um, or as, as um, suggested, to be able to capture that carbon from the atmosphere and store it. Um, the technology, I guess, is, is being developed, but we're not there yet, so. Absolutely, so, okay, so a uh, question from, from Eugene. So thanks, Fred, for this presentation. I want to find out what, to what extent your model can be applied to forest management in other regions, say forest zones in sub-Saharan Africa, and what management options do you think can be considered, especially for forest fringe communities, juxtaposed with timber exploitation for the de for de developmental goals? Yeah, um, so, I, I mean, in terms of the, the models, it's, it's applicable, um, globally uh, already we, we uh, models are run um, at the global level um, the, I guess the main point um, of what I'm trying to say is that um, you need to understand the different processes going into the model because um, models when you run them say in, in sub-saharan Africa will produce some results um, it will give you some output but then if you understand the various processes that actually contribute to um, what you are, you're, you're getting, then you, you have a, a greater confidence in the output from those models. So yes, you can apply it um, globally, but we need to understand the different processes that's going on. Uh, we, we do understand some of them, uh, for example, CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, the effect of light on photosynthesis and so on. Most of them is well understood. Um, some of them less so. And, and that's, that I guess is the, is the main point. Um, in terms of timber exploitation and so on, um, again, if it's managed, so if, if, for example, you have a matured forest that's been there for maybe a hundred years and so on, keeping it intact is great because then you have stored that carbon because so long as the forests are there, the trees are there, they have carbon stored in them, that is not going, um, that is, is, is staying there as, as matured forest. Um, but then if you manage it in a way that maybe you take out some trees which have maybe stayed for a certain time and replace it, then you could actually be increasing the amount of carbon that you're taking out of, of the atmosphere. Especially if that, if that, um, if that, tree or that uh, is used in say construction or which will keep the carbon locked up for even longer. Okay, so uh, thanks for everyone for, for these questions. So I think we're going to end with a couple of questions from which are quite specific from, from uh, Gertz Richter here. Maybe you can see them. So he says, Fred, thanks for a great talk. Models with new evidence can make a difference, which is good, good to know. Um, so two questions. First one, let me start with just the first one. VOC emissions should create particles to create precipitation like emission of oh, precipitation in the tropics. Why does this not happen? Um, so actually, I, I, I did mention um, uh, at the beginning that um, one of the reasons for uh, focusing on BVOCs is that they affect the production of secondary organic aerosols, which uh, serve as cloud condensation nuclei for cloud formation. And so in that process, you'd have um, 
cloud formation and therefore precipitation. It's it's uh, an important part of of, of the um, climate system. That's that's an indirect impact of BVOCs. Um, yeah. What was what was the okay? Yeah, the second one. So. Um... Soil moisture was not enough to compensate atmospheric drought, but could you upscale your model to optimize forest allocation as a function of soil moisture and precipitation? Yes, um, and 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 that's part of my um, research work. Uh, basically, I've, I've spent the last four years or so researching into drought stress impact on on plants at uh, local and, and global levels. And it's, it's, a, it's an active area of research actually, looking at the role of soil moisture stress on, on forests at um, local, regional and, and global levels. So yes, it, it's, it's upscalable. Excellent. Okay, so I think we'll leave it there, 45 minutes for the coffee time. Um, so thank you very much, Fred, for the talk. Very interesting stuff. I certainly learned something there that's, uh, that's really good. I think we're, I'm learning throughout this, this uh, COP26, and we, we hosted a, a meeting on trees last week as well, learning that trees aren't maybe the incredible answer that uh, everyone thinks they are, but they need to, uh, there needs to be a lot of thought behind their use, that, that's for sure. So um, yeah, thanks for everyone for, for coming as well. Um, and just to remind you that we have a final webinar in this series at 11 o'clock on, on Monday morning as well. So um, this has been recorded, so I'm gonna, I'll put this onto the, onto the AAB website as well after, after the event. If, any, if you want to um, uh, recommend it to any of your, every, any of your colleagues. So, so thanks so much, Fred. And uh, I think we'll leave it there. And I hope everyone has a good, good weekend. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks, Fred. All right.